is I'm going to take you through the fundamentals of creativity. Most of you probably have ideas or questions about what creative problem solving is. And I want to actually kind of ground you in what actually I think creative problem solving is. And then we're going to talk about one key tool that you can take away and use. So if that sounds like a plan, that's where we're going. Cool. And then I'm going to leave enough time to actually take questions. And I'm not going to actually use the chat because it's too hard to do chat and talking. So I'm going to hopefully use my moderator, Scott, to actually help me to actually answer any questions or you can speak directly that you guys might have. Cool. So welcome. So first of all, who am I? My name is Paulina LaRocca and I am a creative problem solving expert. Um, and how can I call myself an expert? Excellent question. Um, my background is I worked in for approximately 20 years for large alcohol companies in Australia. Now, the interesting thing about alcohol companies is that they have a lot of money and they do a lot of innovation locally. So in the last role that I worked in, I worked in a global role actually launching and developing new wines. Now, as I got further and further into the innovation process, a real question came up for me because we talk a lot about creativity, we talk a lot about innovation and entrepreneurship, and we tend to use these terms quite interchangeably. And I really got curious about what is the relationship between innovation and creativity. I worked with a lot of agencies in my time and a lot of them were not clear themselves on what creative uh, creativity was. And so that got me curious about, well, if they don't know and they're paid to know, then who knows and where do I find it? And I came across a master's of science in creative problem solving out in Buffalo, New York in the United States. And they had a distance program. So I went on and actually got my master's of science in creative problem solving in 2012. And really it was to understand what is the relationship of creativity in the innovation problem solving process. But what I came out with was something great, much deeper. The interesting thing about creativity versus innovation is I can teach you how to do innovation and you can do a whole thing on design thinking, et cetera, and you may not actually change whatsoever. You may gain some knowledge, you may gain some practical skills, but you may not have an emotional transformation. The difference between creativity and innovation is I like to think of creativity as a meta model. It goes over the innovation process. And what it really talks to is it talks to you as an individual and it talks to you with your emotions. And if you look or have you done any training with design thinking, they don't really talk to, well, I'd say they don't really, they actually don't. They don't talk to what we call the affective skill or the emotional skill. Whereas when creative problem solving, they look both at the cognitive, the mental skill, and as well as the emotional skills that you need to go through in order to transform. And I think that is extraordinarily important. And you really can't go through a creative journey without actually getting back in touch with yourself. And I think that that is the most important thing is emotional growth, not just the ability to launch a new product, but really creative problem solving is so much more than that. It's a life changing tool where I would argue that innovation and the way that we use it is a business tool and hence doesn't deal with things as emotions as well. Whereas creative problem solving fundamentally is a life skill. And when you put yourself in the creative problem solving process, you can expect and will be rewarded with transformation of some sort. So that's a really exciting part, and that is why I'm passionate. So in my time at my last company, what I used my creative problem solving skills or creativity, they are slightly different, but for the sake of today, we'll talk to both, um, to launch a creative leadership school. And we took participants through the whole creative problem solving journey, including an emotional transformation as well. Um, so that is why I guess I can call myself a bit of an expert. So I left big corporate uh, four years ago and I've now been working for myself and I've been doing things and this is my book plug. Yes, buy my book. So yes, I've been writing books on creativity. The latest one is the Holy Bible. Um, and it is about a new concept that I have, which is called creative enlightenment, which we will talk to today, but definitely addresses the emotional transformation. This is my third book. Uh, there's also two other books out there, particularly my first book, Creativity Plus, is a really nice toolkit if you're looking for the basics and the fundamentals about how to actually do a creative problem solving process that results in an innovation. So cool, that's my plug. Um, but yes, that's a little bit about who I am. And today what I'm actually doing is I'm working with organizations of all shapes and sizes to actually get them to unlock their creative powers, uh, creative problem solving powers of their people 
so that they can actually unlock transformation, not just innovation, but continual transformation. Because when your people are empowered, that is when the business can actually go forward in quite great strength. So cool. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about creative problem solving. So for most of us are familiar with the term creativity, and I would guess, and if this was an interactive session, I would actually ask for what is your definition of creativity? But I would hazard a guess that most of you would talk about new ideas. It's about thinking outside the box and making novel connections. And those are all right. Those are all accepted definitions of creativity. But I want to take you a little bit further back in time because a lot of our ideas about creativity and creative problem solving are extremely recent ideas and this informs how we think about them. So did you know that the word creativity was not in the Oxford English Dictionary as late as 1933? That's right, it was not in the Oxford English Dictionary as late as 1933. This is a word that we tend to think of as been around forever and is actually extraordinarily modern. And this is a very important point because if you understand where words come from, you can understand why you think about them the way that you do. Now, if you go back in time, the Greeks had an idea about creativity and it was actually coming from the muses and it would come and it would come in a God kind of transcended moment and it would be unpredictable. And some of those things we do find true about creativity. It's not always that easy to turn on and off. But as we went through the Renaissance, we actually got a change. And in the Renaissance, we actually started to say, hey, we've got this God thing over here, but it didn't do us such great favors. We've also got science. We've got man. Man can do things. And so for the very first time, that kind of concept of creativity started to shift from being God-given to being self-generated, and that there's a person behind this creative problem-solving process, and it can be used to forward mankind. Now, around the 1950s, etc., what we really had was a sense of creativity in the sense of we had artisans and we had artists and they were trying to separate themselves from the artisans. And then we actually had this concept in 1927 where the word physically was used of creativity in a book called Process and Reality written by a guy called Alfred Whitehead. And what he discussed was a sense, a sense of creativity that was quite transcendent, was quite emotional, again, quite evocative. It was human oriented, but it had godlike properties, so to speak. And he really talked very beautifully, but very complicatedly about creative problem solving and the process and the emotion that you feel when you go through it. At the same time, around this time, Americans were coming out of World War II. Now, Americans came out of World War II extraordinarily rich compared to everyone else. And one of the challenges is that they actually started to have an advertising agency, an advertising way of thinking, and they had large amount of goods that they were producing that they need people to consume. So in the 1950s, what you got was a sense of, of creativity being used in advertising. And you often will hear when we talk about creativity is it's the big idea. That came from the advertising guys. And the advertising guys did us a great favor and did us a great disservice. Their great favor was they actually popularized the term creativity. They really kind of took it from this kind of, you know, first entry as being transcendent and godlike. And they made it practical, they made it commercial, and they said that everyone has creativity. And they noticed this because in advertising agencies, and if you watch the show Mad Men, you'll notice that people were surprised. Hey, women can actually do this. It isn't just a male skill, and it isn't actually a skill of necessarily of education. It's weird. Who could be creative? It actually seemed to be quite democratic. So this sense that everyone had some kind of creative endowment came to the forefront. However, one of the challenges is if you're designing an advertising campaign, you need a big idea and then you're done. So this sense of this deeper, more important, more emotional connection with our creativity was lost. Now, if you hear about the term, oh, they're creative, or they work in a creative industry, or they work in a creative career. If you go back before 1950, that term did not exist. You were an industrial designer, you were a graphic designer, etc. You were what you did. But from the 1950s onwards, after the advertising agency kind of hijacked creative problem solving, that's the very first time you get the sense of you're creative and you're not. So in one sense, they democratized it. They gave it to everybody. But on the other sense, they kind of carved a business side off and said, these people are creative and these people are not so creative or not so creative careers. 
And then you had the artists who were just like, wait, what, what? And we just kind of said, okay, so there's this artistic creativity that they're always poor and starving. We have like business creativity. And then we introduced a thing called innovation. So don't be surprised if you're sometimes confused about how these terms are used and actually a greater awareness of how you feel and see creativity. So taking a step back from that, I'm gonna go back to a more transcendent form of creativity, something that's actually much deeper than a big idea. Not all of us are capable of coming up with big ideas, okay? Or even like doing one-on-one ideas and stuff. And we get brainstorming sessions, which came from the advertising men, which is like go into a room, get a post-it note and generate 101 ideas. Some of you will be good at that. Some of you will not. Some of you will prefer a more contemplative, a more thinking, a more thoughtful form of creativity. One that's maybe more active, et cetera. And the way that we frame creativity doesn't really allow for that. It's like, unless you're one of those people who likes to offer up a thousand and one big ideas on the spot or you know, is capable of shouting out the loudest, it's like you feel like you're not creative or if you're not actually in a creative career, you're like not a creative. And this is absurd. All of us are very creative and all of us have very different ways of accessing that creativity and all of us know it when we feel it. And it's one of the most enriching and one of the most powerful things that we can tap into. And for today's session, I will give you some practical tools to get in touch more with your creativity because it shouldn't be elusive and it shouldn't be hard. We tend to think about creativity as something that we need to make time for, that we need to schedule or, you know, give space for. But I also think we fail to realize that we are using creativity in every single second of our lives. Every single second we are using our creativity. If you know a little bit about physics or you know a little bit about how reality is constructed, we are storytelling machines. And what we use our creativity most of the time is to tell the story of ourselves, to tell the stories of how we look in the moment, how we feel in the moment, how other people perceive us, what is our background, what, and all of this to some degree is fiction. It is our story of us, our interpretation of us. And this is where we are all using our creative powers, creative problem solving skills, our creative powers every day. And I really, really, really want you to think about that because if you have a self story that isn't working for you, then you need to think about how you're using your creativity and whether or not you're generating the best story for you. It's a really powerful concept. So it's not necessarily about getting ideas. It's not necessarily about being great at brainstorming. You can be all of those things, but I really want you to think more fundamentally and more deeply about this power that you've been given and how you are using it every single second to drive you forward. Your story of you is a work of creative fiction that you can actually serve you well or serve you not as well as you need it to be. So that's how powerful creativity is and how much it's actually in our lives. It's not a matter of whether or not you need to be more creative. You actually are creative. It's more about waking up to your creative powers and being able to tap into them more deliberately. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can actually do some of these things. Because one thing is being having the knowledge and then the awareness, but the other thing is talking more deeply about what you practically can do with this knowledge and this power. As I mentioned earlier, we have a great fixation in this culture about creativity being about ideas, your ability to generate new ideas, new concepts. And I'm asking you to think differently about this. And my definition of creativity is not about whether or not you can generate new ideas. It's about how to ask beautiful questions. Creativity is about questions. If you ask the right question, you don't need any ideation tools. They will come easily. All your ideas will flow, but it takes a bit of work to ask and frame a beautiful question. And that is a tool that I'm going to give you today. And it is a life tool. It's an innovation tool if you want to use it, but it is much greater than that. And the reason why questions are so much more powerful than ideas is questions are more open ended. If you want to talk about the concept of divergent versus convergent, so divergent is being up there, all new ideas, that kind of beautiful, happy space, and convergent is coming down and making considered choices. Questions are more divergent. They are more up there, and they don't necessarily always have to have answers. 
A beautiful question can be something that you can ponder on, that you can use, and it can actually offer you up beautiful solutions while you ponder on it. We have a fixation in this culture of actually having ideas or having answers to questions. And what I'm asking you for is a bit of a more nuanced, a more deeper understanding of your creativity and less a rush to actually use it to have new ideas or to solve something and more to actually ask beautiful questions and see what space that opens up and where that leads you. So why are questions so important? Questions affect us neurologically. We know from uh, neuro neuroscience, and I'm gonna have to actually look at my notes so I will actually pull this up because this is not my, but I did consult in neuroscience before I did this. Um, questions actually affect three parts of our brain. They affect the perilethal lobe, sorry, um, a singlet load and our medial prefrontal load. There you go. That was garbled to say the least. I will get that properly written down, but it affects, yes, someone's laughing. Good. You laugh. Um, three parts of our brains. The simplest term is it's activating the default network. And the default network is that wonderful place where you start to feel that oneness. If you've ever experienced kind of a spiritual moment or a sense where your boundaries of yourself are not as clear and you're kind of dreaming, it's almost that moment between when you're waking up you know, from a dream before you've got your mobile phone in your hand, and it's that beautiful space. That is your default network. Now, interestingly enough, we do know that when you analyze things, our brain has to do an awful lot of work. It's heavy lifting to actually do that kind of analysis. However, when we're tapping into our default mode, which we do with this kind of creative problem solving with questions, the load on the brain is very, very light. It's actually like the brain is like, yeah, I got this. So it really does suggest that our creativity is not only innate, it is programmed, and it's almost like it's the preferred way that your brain likes to solve problems. Culturally, we do know that our brains are not the same. Genetically, we are very, very similar. I mean, I don't care what race you are, what color you are, etc. how you look. Genetically, we are almost identical. The human species is the most genetically identical species on the planet. There's no one as close to us as us. But our differences do show up due to culture. And one of the ways they show up is in our brains. In Western-based cultures, we devote a lot of processing power to analyzing things, to reading things, etc. And we actually strengthen that part of our brain and weaken other parts because our brain doesn't grow bigger, it just takes away. And we're taking away from some of this innate processing power. So it's really important, while it's great that we can analyze things, that we're not over-reliant on it always being our main way of solving problems, which is like sitting down and nutting it out. It's more about allowing space to come in and asking questions. And questions can actually do this. They affect us neurologically. They also actually do something really beautiful. They change us physically. When you ask a beautiful question, what happens is you physically get lighter and it shifts your emotion because the thing is when you ask a beautiful question, in order for you to understand it, you have to go into that space. You have to imagine what that would be like. And once you imagine it, for one second you were there. For one second you feel, truly believed that that possibility was a reality. And the thing about the brain that we do know is the brain does not distinguish between what is vividly imagined and what is real. I will repeat that. The brain does not distinguish between what is vividly imagined and what is real. So the more time that you spend asking vivid, beautiful questions that you emotionally feel, the more the brain is going to say, hey, that's important to you. I should actually look at that and I'm going to offer you opportunities so that you can resolve that because the brain hates an unanswered question. It likes to noodle that. It just goes and goes and goes. And you have two brains. You have your conscious brain, that's the one that you do the analytical processing, and you have this default network, your unconscious brain, and that actually can operate 24 seven. It operates in dream time. And this is the one that will seek out when you ask a beautiful question, it will seek out answers, but it will seek them out in unusual and original ways. Now there was a, uh, actually she was Australian, not, uh, I think it was probably now about 10, 15 years ago, uh, who did the secret. And it was like, oh, just visualize it, it will come. Well, no, you know, I can tell you right now that that doesn't quite work, but there was some aspects of what she was tapping into that are correct. So I will give you that. The brain does actually offer you serendipitous moments, unexpected moments of surprise, when you start to actually tell it that you are on a search. 
So if you ask a question and you pose it with vividness, you pose it with emotion, you pose it with imagination, the brain will start to actually seek out moments where you can make those connections. And you will feel like the universe is giving you a gift. You will feel like, wow, I saw that, or I met the right person, or how did that connection occur? The universe doesn't work for you. It isn't about giving you gifts at the right moment. I would love it if it did, but it doesn't. However, the brain does work for you. And if the brain says, if you tell the brain that this is important, the brain will make you more attuned to those moments, to those serendipitous connections that might actually take you forward and help you get what you're vividly imagining. So that is a really cool thing. And the beauty is if you don't get too detailed, like the secret said, like if you're after a relationship, you know, put what he drives, what he looks like, etc. you know, no, pose the question and let your imagination offer new ways of actually solving this that might be more interesting than what you thought. And I'll give you a practical example. Maybe if you're deciding that what you actually would like is what might be all the ways that I can have more deep connections. And you might be asking that. It may not be a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or a partner. It may be a dog, it may be a cat, it may be helping disadvantaged kids. It leaves that space open for you to actually see the right opportunity that fulfills it in a way that will be deeply meaningful for you. So practically, how does this work? Cool. We have a thing in creativity called creative language. And it's very simple and you will get it in your PowerPoint deck afterwards. Um, but it starts with three choices of the way to frame a question. How to, how might we, what might be all the ways? I repeat, how to, how might we, what might be all the ways? You will find in creative problem solving that the tools are actually incredibly simple and easy to use. However, when you apply them, they're actually beautifully deep. So very simple, how to, how might we, what might be all the ways? You can choose to start your question with any one of those three. It doesn't matter. It's kind of an intuitive thing about how you feel. The one thing I will say to watch out though is what we tend to do is frame creative questions with how can. And I'm going to discourage you strongly from ever using can when you're talking about creative questions or having a creative conversation. The reason is, is linguistically, there is a, whatever, a, an inversion, sorry, that can implies cannot. And the brain actually picks this up even if you think conversationally you haven't. So the brain says, if you're asking a can question, potentially it cannot be solved. Hence why, how might we? Might not, that's still leaving ambiguity. Or how to, just leaves it right up in the air. Or what might be all the ways? And again, these are just questions that really are opening it up. They are suggesting that there might be infinite possibilities to be, this, this, excuse me, it is suggesting that there might be infinite possibilities and different ways that this question can be answered. Remember earlier when I said, don't worry so much about ideas, when you get a beautiful question, it already starts to suggest that there are multitudes of opportunities and ways of looking at this that might actually give you better insights than if you actually asked a closed question. So that's how you open a creative question using creative language. How to, how might we, what might be all the ways. Very, 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 very simple language. Now it's what you do at the back end of that question that also counts. How to, how might we, what might be all the ways. You can even see by even actually saying those three words, I physically become lighter. It actually starts to open you up and almost make you bigger because it's in its mere phrasing, it's actually opening up the brain to possibilities. But if you really want to actually have a powerful question, you need to think about what you're asking on the other side. What most people do, and you see this a lot in innovation workshops, and you will see this a lot in design thinking workshops as well, is they restate the problem. So how to get my customers to buy more goods. And you can see energetically, you can almost feel it. It kind of goes, eh, I'm not so interested in solving that. Eh, yeah. Imagine if you're in a brainstorm and you're like, oh, well, I don't know. Like, and you feel stupid because you're just like, well, I, I don't know, isn't that why we're here in the first place? And it's not that you're stupid or that you actually aren't inspired. It's the question is wrong. So in those cases, I would blame your facilitator who may be untra untrained. Um, and this is why creative language is so important. What we tend to do is focus on the issue that we're solving rather than the benefit or the outcome we want to receive. So well, the outcome in that case where I gave you, which is you need people to buy more, is really what you're seeking is how can I be financially free? 
or how can I actually have, how can I offer a service that has people running towards my door? You can see it's much more evocative and I'm just playing things in the moment. I didn't have this pre-planned about what I was gonna say, but you can already see having people running towards the door. It's a better question. It's, you, you gotta think about it. You gotta go, huh? But it's leading you to some new places than if I'd actually say, how do we get people to buy more goods? It's just, you can feel creative questions. You can feel their effect on your physiology. You can feel their effect that they actually make you kind of go, huh? And they make you wonder a little bit. And we've been told, oh, don't daydream. Do daydream. That's where the really interesting things happen. That's where the default network is actually working. So the more that you focus your questions on your aspiration about what you want to receive and think about it deeply, think about it, not just in terms of, yeah, I'd like more people to actually buy more goods. So think about what you're really seeking. And oftentimes those are core values. You're seeking freedom. You're seeking connection. You're seeking, no, I wouldn't say happiness. I don't actually think we're seeking happiness, but you're seeking fulfillment. You might be seeking meaning. Now, we are told kind of not to talk to these higher values, but these higher values are actually what motivate us and really what deeply fulfill us and give us purpose in a sense, uh, give us purpose for our lives. And I started at the beginning saying, you know, there's innovation tools out there. This is something fundamentally bigger, deeper, and richer. And it's, it is in some way spiritual, but it's spiritual that you use, that you generate. It's not imposed upon you. It's a way of accessing that side of you. And you can do it simply by asking questions. So how to, um, how might we, what might be all the ways, and then seek the benefit that you're after. You know, what might be all the ways to have deeper, more meaningful connections? Already, and it's not the most perfect question, you could go further, but already you can see how it's lighter, how it's more playful, how it suggests so many possibilities. And it's not like you have to have an ideation session and brainstorming. Not that there's nothing wrong with that. Those have their moments. But I am asking for something at this point, something more deeper and yes, more transcendent and more fun to actually go through. So it's a very simple proposition, but in some ways very deep. It really is. It's about connecting with you, what you value and seeking outcomes in life and posing questions rather than actually saying what the solution is, posing the benefit that you would like to receive. What might be all the ways to be financially free? Now that's an interesting question. That suggests that maybe a career, more education may be part of it, but may not be all of it. And there may be something more deeply there that you need to explore. It's a really personal journey. It can be used practically in business and innovation because all you simply do is in the practical case of how do we get more sales? Look at the business. What problem are they really trying to solve or what benefits do they really want? They want the business to be secure, stable, and a part of a vital part of their lives. So yeah, how can we make the business as vital and alive as us? That's a, it, it's, it's a different way about thinking about creative problem solving. It's a different way about thinking about innovation. It may sound a bit foreign to you, but those are beautiful questions that actually evoke beautiful, deep, and nuanced answers. So my key takeaway for you today is to start to think about creativity as something that is self-generated, is something that is always on. However, we can get caught in the analytical day-to-day -day stuff and forget to actually listen to our default network, which is always there. And a beautiful way to actually do that is to actually stop and think about a question and phrase it in a way using how to, how might we, what might be all the ways, and think about what is the outcome that you're wishing to seek. And don't be shy from actually having a vivid outcome that's emotionally powerful, that pulls you in, that's not the usual, how do I get a million dollars to do this? Really feel how it physically sits with you and whether or not it makes you feel lighter and whether or not it causes you to light up. And that kind of guiding question can be posed continually. And the more that you feed it, the more energy you give it, the more likely you are to actually find ways where it will be resolved, where it will bring in opportunities or people or things that truly start to help you to make that question a beautiful reality. Cool. That's all I had for you today. <laughs> so hopefully I hope you found it provocative, different, interesting. Um, yeah and actually makes you think a little bit differently about this tremendous power that you have. So on that note, I cannot see the chat. So I was gonna hope for some um, 
hopefully, because I do see you guys are all on mute. Hopefully, I was hoping that you could actually ask. I will actually try to turn on my chat. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, somebody said, yes. <laughs> Interesting, I've always used how can. Yeah, well, we do. It's the English language that actually, uh, the way that we're trained does actually make us use how can instead of how to. And I'll give you a practical example. If we're sharing a problem, so to speak, or we're sharing a discussion, and you get that, you get like, well, how can you solve that? It's a little like, that's your problem, bud. You know, like, and when you actually say, how, you know, what might be all the ways that we're going to address this? Again, it becomes a we problem. It, it's suddenly not putting someone down or shoving the problem across the desk. It's actually saying, we own this. What are the ways that we can explore it? Think about it, particularly if you have children. Watch, or even a partner, watch how many times you often will go back with how can instead of how to, or what might be all the ways. It is such a powerful tool because it actually says, let's go into this, let's explore this together. It's not your problem, it's not my problem. It's not a problem. Let's have fun and explore this thing and see where it goes. Toot, toot, toot. Any other questions? Um, I guess, well, I can't unmute you because I don't have control. <laughs> so any other questions via the, the chat? Do, 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 do. <laughs> I amused myself. Um, yeah, I'll give you a chance to actually digest because I actually have given you an enormous amount of information in a very short period of time. I'm not getting any more questions to the chat. So I would just ask, has everyone found this useful, interesting? Any other kind of thoughts you want to share or anything? Yes, I just say, wow. <laughs> <laughs> We love you. <laughs> a lot of to digest, but <laughs> it is that was amazing. <laughs> cool. Well, these are the last moments, so yes, really amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. I'll give it just a little bit more, but um, again, I will send out a handout afterwards, but yeah. These are really, really deep questions that you're asking. And I imagine that if you've been here through the whole webinar, yeah, I you probably shifted a little bit. Yes. Can I make a question? Um, yes. I don't know. I, sometimes I find it a bit um, hard to get new ideas when I'm working by myself and I don't have anyone next to me to talk and also to give a push for that. Do you have any suggestion for people that work like so, like kind of solo to, to push it? Yes, I do. Look, I would imagine, and I'm going to take a guess here, that oftentimes when we're thinking about new ideas, we're not that far from our computer, we're not that far from our desk, and everything like that. Um, look, I know this, and I don't practice it enough, I'll be honest, but gosh, every time I do what I think I should do this more often, walk. Get up and walk. Walk. It is the most extraordinary thing. We tend to think, and we've been trained, that our bread, our power, processing power is all here. It's not. The mind and the body are connected. The more that you actually move, and if you can't, fidget. Do this. You know, have pipe cleaners, whatever, but play. Physically move. The more you physically move, the more ideas will come to you. I mean, how often have you thought, like, you know, where you go to the bathroom or you get a drink of water and suddenly that kind of problem starts to get resolved? That's why. It's the, it's the brain reconnecting to the body. So during this pandemic, it's actually given me a lot of opportunities to do walk and talks. And I will host all my meetings outside, walking, etc., because we just get to a deeper space. Also, there's something um, quite easier, even if you're on the phone, to be more intimate with someone. When you're kind of outside and you're away from your space, you're kind of more you, but you're alone. I would just say move, play with the cat, play with the dog, but move. And if you can at all, get outside, go for a walk around the block, but try not to do it actually glued to your phone. That is the challenge is that we are so addicted to these phones and they are so well programmed to actually do that. But yeah, wherever you can, yeah, just go out for a walk, turn off the buzzing note on the phone and have a little bit of space. And you'll be surprised at how things that were a problem, suddenly you just have more space, more opportunities, more things will shift. Cool. Yeah, the garden is a very good place for thinking also. Yes, there is a secret garden right around the corner, work in Milson's Point. Yes, uh, Wendy's Secret Garden. It's actually pretty amazing, but you don't need a secret garden. You can actually walk past traffic and just walk through a city street, but just don't use your phone and just actually move. You know, that is really super important. So does that answer your question? Hopefully, yes, because you've been put on mute, but yes. <laughs> cool. 
Do you ask yourself every time questions that you meet? Do you ask yourself questions when you meet someone for the first time? Perhaps a question which would suggest more possibilities and judgments. That is an excellent question. No, I don't. I am as imperfect as anybody on the planet when it comes to actually always applying my creative problem solving skills. So there you go. Should I? Yes. Um, however, when I'm kind of in the state, particularly after I've delivered a workshop or I'm getting ready, those are times when I'm in that state that I'm more consciously aware of it, that I am much more likely to have a much more open conversation with people or actually just talk to people. Um, so yeah, and it's a really nice space to be in. And you have hit on something that maybe for a future webinar we can talk, but it is about deferring judgment. It's about getting out of your own self-talk and stop worrying about the story of you and actually seeing the person in front of you or seeing the opportunity in front of you and allowing the space to come in. Creativity and mindfulness are not the same thing, but my gosh, they're close. Mindfulness is kind of considered rightfully or wrongfully is this, you know, absence of nothing, this mm. creativity is like an active form of mindfulness. It's just you're being in the present. You're not deferring. You're not judging people. You are deferring. It's not saying you can't judge. You're deferring judgment and you're just allowing what is to be seen for what it is and enjoying that moment. Yes. Some cliff walking and sometimes for up coochie to bond. There's so many beautiful places in Sydney. We are so privileged. And if you're not in Sydney and you're in lockdown, I feel for you. But it's even if it's taking a shower or kind of just going into a quiet room, but the more that you can move your body, I do strongly believe the more creative you will be. And it doesn't take much. It can be a walk to the shops. It doesn't always have to be glorious scenery, but we are very privileged in this country that it can be. Cool. Any last comments, thoughts, questions, anything? Now's your moment. Thank you, great things. Could music stimulate creativity? Amazing question. Yes, of course it can. Um, and that is a very individual thing about what types of music will actually do it. But yes, music, absolutely. Again, it kind of gets us in back into our bodies and it gets us connecting in a different way. Now, I'm not a huge music person, so it doesn't come up a lot for me, but my husband is a massive music fan. We've got opera going in the house that I can't stand it sometimes, but yes, <laughs> I can see what it does for him. It really allows him to kind of go into this dreamlike state and actually kind of forget his assumptions and allows himself to actually go into a deferring judgment space. So it can be tremendously, tremendously powerful. And again, see, you guys know this. It's like, I don't have to show you this. You actually really do know how to tap into your creativity. It truly has been educated out of us. Ken, Sir Ken Robinson, it's the number one YouTube. He's been, uh, he recently died. But I mean, some of the things that he talks to is true, that we have been educated out of our creativity. So there is a lot about returning to your instinct and re- connecting with yourself in the ways that work for you and not thinking about what you should do, but what you know works. So what do you have? What, what is the right way to ask questions for yourself when you have to decide between two choices? For example, job offers. Ah, hmm. That is talking to your intuition. Um, oftentimes you actually know the answer and oftentimes you may be hesitating to, ch to ch choose an answer because you think this is what I should do. So I'll give you a top tip. If there's two offers that you're considering and one is what you really should, really should, you probably shouldn't do it. You shouldn't be doing anything in life that you should have to do. Uh, it's a really good word to listen out to because when you're doing it, usually you're going against your energy and going against your real strong preference. So listen to things when you should do something. And it's you usually saying it. I'm talking about when you say, oh, I really should do the dishes. Well, you probably should. But, you know, it's the energy that you drag into that thing. Either reframe it so that it's actually offering a gift to your partner or who cares? Why do these things have to be done? You're probably following a convention that you're no longer thinking about. So if there's any should about that opportunity, I think you have your answer there. And then really, it's kind of being playful. If you're looking at two opportunities, go into them. Visualize what one could be and play with it. And actually put yourself in there. Walk around the space. Actually vision what it would be like going in every day. And do it with the other one. You'll feel the differences. You'll know where you want to go and learn to actually trust your energy. We have so much incredible power that we actually get educated out of. We think about logical. I mean, logical would be make the list of pros, make the list of cons, see which one is longer. Yeah, I think you probably already know. And listening to your intuition is also very helpful. So just envision those possibilities, explore them with no judgment 
and see which one feels right and make the decision from there. Cool. Anything else? I think we got one more minute. Oh, I may have longer. Dude, dude, dude. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you are very welcome. Yes, trusting ourselves is a very powerful tool. Cool. Any more thoughts, comments, questions? Don't think so. All good. If we finish with the questions, so we have one more. Okay, I've been consistently sensing that some people's company provides space for creativity. Okay, so I've been consistently sensing that some people's company provides space for creativity while other people's company shut it off. Yes, there are certain people that are actually creativity downers and there are certain people who are creativity playfulness, who really open it up and make it exciting. Life is short. I cannot tell you enough how short life is. Spend it with those that lift you up, that fill you with possibility, that get you excited about your day, and try to spend as little as possible with those that actually bring you down. Now, in another webinar, we can look at ways of actually changing people who may not be in that creative space and shifting them out of their analytical space, more into a creative space. Um, but for the practicals of this, yeah, go with beautiful people who light you up. Your life is gonna be much better that way. Cool. All right. Well, on that note, I really, really, really want to thank everyone for making the time coming in. And yeah, it's been a great, I wish I could see you in person, but ah, the joys of a pandemic. Um, but yes, uh, hopefully, yes, I will actually have a chance to actually meet you live at one of my creative live workshops once we go back to that um, or whatever, follow me on social media, whatever. But it was really, really, really nice um, spending time with all of you. And for those of you on the call that I actually do know, um, yes, also a big hug to you for showing up and just to say it's lovely to see your name <laughs> on the list as well. So thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Paulina. That was amazing. That was actually very interesting, even for me. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to do some things, I had to stop everything and listen to everything you were said. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. In honor of Lenway, cool. we are very, very proud to have this talk today. Very interesting indeed, like Monica said. So thank you very much. So who want to rewatch again? Because I think I will need to rewatch it. <laughs> There was a lot of deep stuff in there. There was. <laughs> details. So to look at, I'm going to send the link for everyone tomorrow. Of the cool. Group. And I'll send you the PowerPoint as well so that they have the, um, the notes as well. Yes, I can add to that. Thank yes. you very much once and again, Pauline. Talk to you very soon. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Awesome. Yes. See you. Thank you. Bye.